what I see in the future is, is that of, of being the purveyor of local news. Uh, we are local. Our franchise is the local news. There's no one else that, that, that has the, the system to gather the local news and produce the local news uh, like your, your local newspaper. Well, our political point of view is, is middle of the road. Uh, we feel we have responsibility to the community to, to really uh, help the community form opinions on, on, on key critical issues. And, uh, you know, I, I see myself as a, a political independent as far as that goes. And, and whatever's right for the community is, is I think, what we're going to, to support. As publisher, uh, I, I, I do uh, retain 51% of the vote on the editorial board. I seldom exercise that because we have some, uh, some you know, good ideas and, and, and people that, that uh, I, I think we do come to conclusions where we're not always consensual in, in, in all of our decisions, so I seldom exercise a 51% vote on the editorial board. But overall, I'm, uh, my, my role is, is that of, of, of a leader, and, and I, I try to lead by example. I, I, I work hard myself and try to make good decisions, and, and you might say I'm the, uh, uh, the, the number one visionary of the newspaper, you might say, and um, it's my role to, to make sure we're always looking ahead to see what we're doing to make sure we, we know where we're going and that we're doing the things to help us to get there. One C-SPAN school bus spends the weekend in Philadelphia. The other bus is in New Orleans for the Cable 97 trade show. Get C-SPAN schedule information 24 hours a day by calling our schedule hotline at area code 202-628-628. 2205. Our program schedules are also available online. You'll find us on the internet, the World Wide Web, and a variety of online services. You can watch for schedule information. At 15 and 45 minutes past each hour, check the bottom of your screen for updates. Also several times each day, listings of programs coming up over the next few hours. These on-screen updates normally air just before 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Time and at other times through the day. The Preview Channel provides our program schedule as well. If your local cable company carries the Preview Channel, you can check it throughout the day for updated C-SPAN schedule information. C-SPAN 2 is a public service created by America's cable television companies. Each weekend on C-SPAN 2, look for About Books, original programming devoted to books, authors, bookstores, and the publishing industry. Here's a look at our program schedule. Next, historian Howard Zinn on the interpretation of history. Then Harvard professor Samuel Huntington talks about the effect of cultural diversity on global politics. He's followed by Jill Abramson of the Wall Street Journal, who discusses honorariums and journalistic ethics. Later, on America and the Courts, lawyers and judges in a mock trial debate a law banning distribution of indecent material over the Internet. And that's our program schedule. Now historian, player, and political activist Carl Zinn. He speaks about the interpretation of history and how our understanding of it affects the future. Mr. Zinn is author of the book, A People's History of the United States. He spoke last month at Carleton College in Minnesota. The program lasts about an hour. Good morning. My name is Josh Gardner, and I'm a senior history major. Before I introduce today's speaker, 
I have been asked to remind you that next week's convocation will be Wayne Smith, visiting professor of Latin American Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He will be speaking on relations between the United States and Cuba. The feminist and anarchist Emma Goldman once said that, quote, history may be a compilation of lies, nevertheless it contains a few truths, and they are the only guides we have for the future. Today's speaker, Howard Zinn, has dedicated his life to writing the lies of history and employing those lessons to build a better future. He is a noted historian, a gifted playwright, and a passionate political activist. Most of us know Mr. Zinn as the author of that book, A People's History of the United States, which our high school social studies teacher assigned as a contrast to the traditional text. In fact, the work was wildly successful and helped to usher in a whole new approach to American history. Zinn's heroes are not Columbus, capitalists, or presidents, but Native Americans, industrial workers, and all those who have risked everything to combat tyranny and oppression. Believing it impossible to separate the study of history from one's inner convictions and sense of justice, Mr. Zinn is also a tireless social crusader. Through the years, this marriage of scholarship and activism has alternatively found him writing articles attacking the Kennedy administration for its inaction with segregation and helping to organize student sit-ins, writing a book entitled Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal, and speaking out against the Vietnam War at peace protests. And like most good Americans, his belief in action has landed him in jail a couple of times along the way. This fall, I read Mr. Zinn's most recent work, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train, A Personal History of Our Times. And I must say that it's his optimism and faith in the capacity of the American people to enact social change is truly inspiring. It is, it is a must read for all disillusioned college students or anyone anxious about the direction our nation is taking. I'm very excited about today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Howard Zinn to Carleton College. Thanks for inviting me to Carleton. Uh, this is a special place. Well, for one thing, you have Marv Davidoff teaching here. And, uh, and, uh, and I, think, I think it's a tribute to Carleton that you would uh, have Marv Davidoff come here and teach and without asking him, how many PhDs do you have? Uh, and your only question maybe was, uh, what have you done with your life? And uh, what have you done on behalf of uh, peace and justice? And if you've been doing that all your life, maybe you have something to say to our students. So, and, uh, and I learned last night that students at Carleton College have been working with people in the community uh, to do something about the, the welfare situation in Minnesota and in the nation. And to me, that's, that's the best sign of where the students are getting an education. Uh, because one of the things I learned by going to college and by being out of college is uh, you very often can learn a lot more by leaving the classroom uh, and getting involved in social activism. Uh, and then when you come back to the classroom, it, everything you study means so much more to you. So, uh, yeah. I'm glad to be here. I have, I have about uh, 40 minutes, and uh, I'm uh, going to try in 40 minutes uh, to tell you what I've learned uh, in 40 years. Uh, just trying to save you some time. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I. I I promised I would talk about history, and sometimes I keep my promise. Uh, and I, I suppose I got into history, uh, teaching and writing history, be, uh, not just because it was interesting. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, it's fun. It's uh, you know, sort of uh, investigative things. You, you read people's private letters. Uh, you read secret government documents. You read things that 
the government doesn't want you to know. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's interesting. But it's, it's much more than that. Uh, I think I really got into history, not just because it's interesting. I, I didn't want to just be one of those historians who sort of goes into the past and, uh, and gets lost and never comes out. You know, I, I wanted to go into the past and, and come out and, and see what I could find out from the past that would be useful in what is happening in the world today. And uh, because I came to the conclusion that history is a kind of life and death matter. Uh, I read George Orwell, and, and probably you know some of George Orwell's works in 1984 on Animal Farm. Now, maybe his, his lesser known, but very, very remarkable book, Homage to Catalonia. But in, in 1984, at one point, he, he says, talks about the control of history. He says, whoever controls the past controls the future. And whoever controls the present controls the past. Uh -huh. So that those people who uh, control what we know today, uh, that is the mass media, uh, the government, uh, the educational system, the textbook publishers, the people who control what we know today are uh, determining our future. Unless we break away from that, uh, and unless we begin to learn things for ourselves, and there's nothing more important in education than breaking away from the authorities, breaking away from the books that are given you, from the things they're told you, from the television broadcasts that are aimed at you, and just going out and looking for yourself, looking in the dark corners of the libraries, uh, uh, picking up the things that are handed out on street corners, <laughs> really, just getting information that you can't get. Uh, anywhere else. And uh, so I, I decided history was important. Uh, you can tell the importance of history by, by how much controversy is raised when people start to write or speak a different kind of history. Have you noticed how much excitement there's been? I almost use the word hysteria about the new history, that is about the, the, the reteaching of Columbus, or the a new view of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or uh, uh, an expansion of the curriculum to go beyond the usual tributes to Western civilization, uh, and to talk about the third world and non-Western civilizations, and those people who have been humiliated by Western civilization. Notice how, uh, when I say excited, when I say hysterical, I'm, I'm not exaggerating too much. I mean, people, they will say things like, uh, uh, George Will. They will say things like George Will. That's, 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 that is real hysteria. Uh, nothing can make one angrier. Uh, George Will talked about the disagreements over curriculum, which you think is a mild affair. I mean, a disagreement over curriculum? That's the stuff of boring faculty meetings. Uh, no, disagreements over curriculum, he said, is a, a uh, part of a war, a war of aggression against the Western political tradition. A war of aggression. Uh, and Hilton Kramer, uh, along the same line, said, it is our civilization that we believe to be at stake in this struggle. I mean, you would think we were talking about World War II and D-Day, you know, a civilization is at stake. And, then, and somebody from the National Association of Scholars, which is a, a euphemism for an organization of right-wing uh, uh, writers and uh, uh, says uh, about the new history the barbarians are in our midst uh, I, I winced when I read that because I felt he was talking about me uh, but the reason there's all this excitement about the new history is that it's not just about the past uh, 
It's not, uh, it's not about uh, straightening the record just so that we will know what happened in the past more accurately. Because everything about the past is about the present and the future. The, the, uh, the excitement over Columbus and the changing of the Columbus story is there because uh, it has all sorts of meaning for today. Because when you start to, to reconsider Columbus, always looked upon as a hero for generation after generation after generation, and it's interesting, isn't it? Here is a, a, a liberal democratic country, a marketplace of ideas, et cetera, et cetera. One story was told about Columbus for generation after generation after generation. Columbus the hero, Columbus the adventurer, Columbus the brave man, Columbus the Bible reader. I mean, what could be better? The, the religious man. Uh, and uh, you wonder. We know that's true of totalitarian countries. They just get one view of history, but we're a democratic country. How come? Is it possible that we have a control of information that is more subtle, more insidious, but just as clear as the control of information that takes place in what we call totalitarian countries? But there's a reason for this, and that is Columbus represents Western civilization at its worst. Oh, well, there is Western civilization at its best. You know, and there are nice things you can say about Western civilization, about advancements in technology and, and, and uh, medicine and science and education. And yes, there are, there are positive things you can say about Western civilization at its best, but there's also Western civilization at its worst. And that's what Columbus represents. And by that I mean uh, aggression, expansion, the enslavement of, of other peoples, the uh, assignment to other peoples of a status less than a human being, which is what Columbus assigned to the Indians that he, that he found uh, on Hispaniola, enabling him to enslave them and kidnap them and torture them and, and kill them. Uh, uh, that was omitted for generation after generation because it, it, uh, it raises too many questions about uh, the human costs of what is called progress in Western civilization. Raises too many questions about greed, because after all, Columbus came here uh, not to convert the Indians to Christianity, uh, although we talked about that. Um, but he came here for gold. Uh, and then, and to, to honor that, to honor the the killing and kidnapping of other people for profit uh, is something that's been going on for too long. And to question that is to question capitalism, really. I think there's a connection. I know this is hard to take I mean, we, because we all love capitalism. We have to. We're in the midst of it. It surrounds us, right? We must love it, you see. And to suggest that there's some connection between capitalism and ruthless greed uh, is troubling. <laughs> uh, you know. I remember reading a, a description of uh, capitalism as the adjectives used was savage, unbridled capitalism. And then I looked to see who said that, and I thought, well, obviously some communist, right? Uh, it was John, Pope John Paul, <laughs> you see, which made me worry a little about him. Uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if after he said that, he said that in an interview with an Italian journalist, I wouldn't be surprised if after that he had ended up on the FBI's list. <laughs> I could just see, see the FBI people filing through their photos, oh, there's the Pope. Yeah, uh, 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 savage, unbridled capitalism. Yeah, the, the, so the Columbus story is a story of not about yesterday, but about today. And the rethinking of the bombing of Hiroshima is not just a question of, of correcting the record of what happened in August of 1945. It's a question of, of, of asking uh, about the bombs that we are stockpiling and have been stockpiling ever since World War II. 
asking why we, the Soviet Union and whatever other countries are carrying nuclear weapons, why we've been ready to do the same thing as was done in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, only to do it many times over, uh, and ask whether uh, we are still in the psychology and whether our leaders uh, are still trying to keep us in the psychology of justifying the large-scale killing of people just so long it's for a good reason. Uh, you know, governments, uh, when they kill in large numbers, they always do so for a good reason. Uh, and that's what we must be on guard against. Uh, so these are, these are not past issues. Uh, these are uh, present, present issues, things that we uh, uh, that tell us that we study history uh, because we want to understand something uh, about our time. So you may get the idea that in my, in my views of history, I have not been neutral. Uh, I never considered myself a, a neutral teacher. I always start my classes off uh, by, by telling students right off, I said, this is not going to be a neutral class. Uh, I would say, uh, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Put another way, the world is already going in certain directions, certain terrible directions. Wars are taking place. People are getting killed. Uh, Landmines are exploding. Uh, uh, children are going hungry. Uh, in a world like this, uh, to be neutral, uh, in anything you do, uh, is to collaborate with whatever is going on. And I never wanted to be a collaborator. And so I saw teaching and I saw writing as something that could not possibly be neutral. Uh, and that I had to take a stand. Uh, and I wanted my students to know it. And I wanted them to feel free to take their stands. Uh, and then let us have an honest discussion about all, all of the issues uh, in the world. So, uh, so I studied history uh, because I, I cared about, about what was going on in the world. Uh, and I never believed in what they call objectivity. Uh, unless objectivity means uh, uh, not deliberately lying, not distorting, not concealing information, uh, that it goes against uh, what you've declared yourself for. Uh, but if objectivity means uh, pretending that you don't have a view about what is going on in the world or what has happened in the world, well, I, ne I never believed that objectivity was possible and I never believed it was desirable. I never believed it was possible because in doing history and writing history and, uh, and teaching history, you're always selecting out of an enormous body of data. Uh, and it can only be a very, very tiny selection out of, of that great body of information, inevitably. And what you select for, as in most cases, what is selected for you by whoever produces the textbooks, or whoever prints the newspapers, or whoever gives you the news at 11 o'clock, Whatever is selected for you is uh, dependent on the viewpoint of the selector. Uh, and so I, I understood that, that there could be no such thing as an objective presentation of the facts of the past. That selection always depended you know, on the point of view of the selector. And that the most important question you could ask about anything, any set of historical facts presented to you is, not so much is this a false fact or is it a true fact. The most important question you can ask is, what has been left out? What hasn't been told me? Just as you know, things were, they didn't lie about Columbus when they said he was a brave man and a religious man. No, they just omitted things. Uh, they didn't lie about Hiroshima when they said, yes, the war ended right after the bombing of Hiroshima. And, and the Japanese were cruel in the war and so on, but they left out things. Because they left out the messages that went back. And I saw this last, in, 
year in 1995 when there were all the discussion about Hiroshima and with all the press talking about Hiroshima, but I didn't see the, the information that uh, historians and other people who study the subject know about the, the telegrams that went back and forth from the Japanese uh, diplomats to their emissary in Moscow trying to negotiate an, uh, an end to the war. Uh, telegrams that were intercepted by American intelligence and that they knew about, which indicated the Japanese were on the verge of surrender, that the bombs did not have to be dropped. We didn't have to kill all those people. Uh, the withholding of information, the omission of information, uh, the, that is, is uh, to look for that is the most important lesson one can learn in, in how to <coughs> how to read <coughs> excuse me, and how to listen uh, uh, when you give it information, <coughs> especially by, by people uh, in authority. Uh, and, uh, and when the government gives you information, always asks, what have they left out? Uh, the government, not long ago, the, uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a scholar who resigned from a government commission and that, that advised the State Department on its production of volumes on foreign relations of the United States, he resigned because the United States government insisted on holding to its, its uh, rule uh, that it could not print information, documents of American foreign policy, unless they were at least 30 years old. That is, it could not talk about anything that happened within the last 30 years. Uh, but he said it went even further, that even when they produced volumes on events that happened more than 30 years ago, uh, they were lying about it. They were distorting it. He, he resigned because he saw the volumes they were producing about 1952, 53, 54, and he said the government has distorted and left out information about what we did in Iran in overthrowing that government, what we did in Guatemala in overthrowing that government, what we did in Southeast Asia in helping the French to maintain colonial control uh, over Indochina, and, and so he resigned his job. So, um, you know, government documents uh, have to be inspected very closely, and, and the question asked, what have they left out? The great journalist I.F. Stone, when, uh, if, if you don't know who he is, find out. Uh, he's one of the, one of the, one of the great uh, journalists in American history, and he, when he would speak to classes of journalism students, he would say, some of the best advice I can give you as people who are going to be journalists can be summed up in two words. Governments lie. Uh, so uh, I was uh, always interested in what was being omitted, uh, omitted in the mass media, omitted in government documents, and omitted in, in the history textbooks. One of the main things that was omitted in the, in the books, uh, it occurred to me at a certain point, uh, was the class nature of American society. Uh, class is something that, is, that we don't like to talk about in the United States. We don't use words like uh, class consciousness and class struggle and class conflict. Uh, uh, I remember during the, if you can remember way back to the Cam presidential campaign of Bush and Dukakis. Try to remember uh, that. <laughs> what an exciting, can you imagine what an exciting campaign. Uh, yeah. And Bush, uh, two giants. Uh, uh, and Bush, uh, Bush accused Dukakis of appealing to class conflict, which really surprised me, because I was from Massachusetts. Dukakis had been the governor of Massachusetts. I could not imagine Dukakis uh, getting excited about class or getting excited about anything. <laughs> uh, so, uh, class is something we don't like to talk about. But in fact, the history of the United States is a history of class conflict from the very beginning. We had class from the beginning. We didn't all come here as pilgrims. I remember that was the impression I had and after going to school. Everybody came here and they dressed like those people in those funny clothes, you know. And, uh, and we were all equal. 
And somehow some people ended up very rich and some other people ended up poor. How did that happen? You know, I guess some people must have worked much harder. You know, like a million times harder. You know. You know. So, uh, but then, you know, reading a little bit of colonial history, you learn, well, well, no, we didn't come here equal. Uh, some people came here with enormous land, grants of land given to them by the crown, huge, hundreds of thousands of acres of land, and other people came here with nothing. Of course, black people came here with less than nothing, and they came back here as slaves and white people came as indentured servants, and others came with no property. And from the very beginning of, of our history, in the 17th century, uh, we were already rich and poor. We were already people with wealth and power, and, and other people with, with nothing. Uh, and when, the, the, when the, the Constitution was drawn up, uh, it was a recognition of that. I mean, the people who drew up, uh, when, when Madison was arguing for the adoption of the Constitution, one of the reasons he gave was, now look, you know, there are people with property and people without property, uh, and there's going to be trouble. I I'm paraphrasing Madison. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really, is, he, he wrote so elegantly, and I, you know, I, I, I've, I've always tried to recapture, you know, that, uh, uh, 18th century style, but it hasn't worked. Uh, um, I think I'm up to the, I've gotten back to the 19th century, but not far enough. But Madison, it's, we've got to worry about <coughs> factions. <coughs> By factions, he meant classes. <coughs> well, you see, Marx hadn't been born yet. And, and uh, but he talked about factions, property, no property, and how you need, needed to have this new government, this new constitution, this uh, strong central government in order to, to keep the peace, in order to make sure, as he put it, that there would not be a rage for paper money, which poor farmers wanted in order to pay off their debts, or for an equal division of property, or as he put it, and these were his exact words, for any other improper or wicked object. And so, uh, yeah, the, the Constitution was a class document. When I first read Charles Beard's An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, a book which has the distinction of being one of the few books ever written by a historian which, which, which uh, uh, excited an editorial from the New York Times denouncing it. Uh, Beard talked about the, the class interests of the Founding Fathers. You, you probably know the Founding Fathers were not a multicultural group. <laughs> they were 55 uh, rich white men. Uh, maybe one or two of them could be classified as not so rich as the others. But it's, and the Constitution uh, set up a government that would set benefit the interests of that class represented by those 55 men. Uh, and it's interesting because today you hear talk about big government. Big government is bad. Uh, Clinton said right in, in the course of you know, the campaign, the era of big government is over. And uh, everybody, Republicans, Democrats, and the media, and they repeat again and again, you know, big government is bad. You know, big military isn't bad. You know, military is not the government, I guess. You know, big, there, there are big things that are not bad that the government do, and there are other things. Medicare, that's bad. <laughs> what if, if we had a national health program run by the government the way they have in other countries which work very well and which give health care free to everybody, that would be big government. The Constitution set up big government, uh, but it set up big government on behalf of the upper classes. Uh, it set up a government that would be strong enough to protect the interests of the bondholders, uh, pay off their bonds. You could find an unbroken thread running from the founding fathers down 
to the Federal Reserve System of today and government legislation to protect the bondholders. The, the, a strong government was set up by the Constitution to protect the bondholders, to protect slave owners against slave revolts, to protect land speculators who were going out west, to protect uh, them against uh, Indian attacks. Indians seemed to think it was their land. Uh, to protect manufacturers uh, by, by uh, tariffs. Uh, and that's, that's the history of legislation in this country has been history of class legislation. Of government, of legislation on behalf of the rich and powerful in this country, uh, right from the uh, Hamilton's first economic message to Congress, right through right through the, the 19th century when the government was giving huge subsidies to the railroads, uh, 20 million acres of land given free to the railroads by the states in the 1850s, 100 million acres of land given free uh, to the railroads by the federal government during the Civil War. They don't, when they give us histories of the Civil War, they, they tell us excitedly about the battles of Gettysburg and the battles of Antietam and the battles of Fredericksburg, and, and they don't tell us much about that 100 million acres of free land. Uh, I would call that welfare on a very large scale. You try getting an acre of land from the government. Just write a letter to your congressman. Say, I would like, I'm, not asking much, you know, <laughs> but I've been reading about the Union Pacific Railroad, you know, and I would like one acre. You know. It's, uh, you know, my, it's for my family. Yeah, I believe in family values. Let's <laughs> uh, try it. The, the subsidies continue all through. The uh, subsidies. Higher and higher tariffs to protect the manufacturers. You know. Subsidies. In World War II, the aircraft industry in the United States would have collapsed if not for the, the government supplied 92% of the capital for the aircraft industry in World War II. Billions of dollars. And at the end of World War II, when we, no, we didn't need the war planes anymore. You could argue before that, well, we needed it <laughs> for the war. Uh, after the war, uh, the government continued to subsidize the aircraft industry, which would have uh, gone out of business if not for government subsidies. And you can read the memoranda that went back and forth between Assistant Secretary of the Air, Stuart Symington, and the heads of Lockheed and the other aircraft companies, in which Symington says, uh, don't worry, fellows. That's also a paraphrase. Uh, <laughs> or maybe it's an exact quote. <laughs> don't worry, guys. Uh, We'll take care of you. Uh, and uh, he said, in one of his letters, he said, we, let's not call it subsidies. Let's call it security. Well, uh, you know, I think welfare mothers around the country should say, we're not asking for welfare. We're just asking for security. Yeah, you know, that's all. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, the, the, the whole history of, of, of uh, I, I remember the history that I learned in, in high school, the history of the, the, the wonders of the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, how great it was that the railroads went across the continent and the steel mills went up, and the United States became the number one economic power in the world. But I didn't learn, and this, this was omitted, from, but I didn't learn about the human cost of what was called progress of industrialization of the improvement of technology. I didn't learn about the girls who went to work in the textile mills in New England at the age of 12 and died at the age of 25. I didn't learn about the Irish and Chinese immigrants who worked on the railroads uh, and by the 20,000 of them on the Union Pacific Railroad in the heat and the cold 16 hours a day and died of sickness and, and uh, overwork. I didn't learn about that. Instead, we got things like, uh, oh, the, these were the gay 90s. How gay? <laughs> well, I, I won't question the word gay when it comes down. Were all people like that in the 90s? Uh, were people happy in the 90s? It was the gay, the roaring 20s, the jazz age, you, the age of prosperity. 
R I mean, right up through graduate school, I was getting the same designations for these periods. And you had to look behind these, these overall S statements about a period to say, well, but how are ordinary people living in those? How are ordinary people living in the gay 90s? Uh, what about the kids, the children who, in Philadelphia who died by the thousands in the 90s in the Depression of 1893 because they were drinking polluted water from the river while the rich had clean water? Uh, water is a class phenomenon. Just as fire is a class phenomenon, the people who die in fires are the people who live in, in those uh, little uh, houses that are susceptible to fire or who have to use uh, heating equipment you know, that can explode and so on. Uh, so uh, all this, all this, and today we are expected to estimate the state of our society and the state of our economy and the prosperity of our people, uh, how? By looking at these uh, overall statements made, the economy is up. Uh, the uh, figures are given to us, which are sort of aggregate figures. You know, uh, unemployment has gone down. The uh, I just saw a figure you know, just the other day. The average income of Americans has risen. You, you average Donald Trump. And you know, a factory worker, <laughs> and the, the average has definitely gone up. Uh, so uh, the Dow Jones average, every night, every night without fail, the Dow Jones average, uh, and we're supposed to, after we get that night after night, begin to believe that the Dow Jones average is an accurate reflection of how people are living in this country. The Dow Jones average has gone up. I feel wonderful. You know? I mean, try that. Next time you, uh, you're in a restaurant, tell the waitress, have you heard that the Dow Jones average has gone up? You know? you know? uh, I'm sure you'll get much better service when you, uh, when you cheer the waitress up with that news. Uh, and so we... Uh, we get these, what, what Kurt Vonnegut called grand balloons, these uh, the great big balloons which, which in, encompass uh, a situation and, and with, but which leave you ignorant of, of all the details of how uh, people, people are living. And, uh, and, and so it, it's possible to believe that we are living well if, if you just pay attention to the Dow Jones average or if you just stay in one part of the city and if you don't venture into another part of the city, but you have to, in every city in this country, if you go from one end of the city to the other end of the city, you will see what a class society we live in. And you will see the people in New York and Chicago and Cleveland and Detroit and Boston, and you'll see the people who live in very nice houses in one part of the city, and the people who live like the third world people in the slums of Brazil in another part of the city. Uh, and so when, when President Clinton gets on the air in his inaugural address, and talks in such glowing terms about uh, how wonderful everything is and, and uh, this inflation has gone down and income has gone up and unemployment and so on. Uh, well, s serious questions need to be asked. Uh, what did he omit? <laughs> he seems to have omitted the fact that, that uh, every year in this country 40,000 children die before they are one year old. That the, in infant mortality, the United States ranks 20th among 20 industrialized countries in the matter of dealing with infant mortality. Uh, that there are parts of, of American cities where the rate of, of, of children dying, of infants dying, is like the rate in Bangladesh or, or Guatemala. Uh, and uh, th these are the things you know, omitted uh, in these very romantic descriptions of, of, of how well we are doing. And it's possible, it's possible to live in, in the United States because we are a very rich country and we have many, many signs of wealth and we do have a big middle class, even though that middle class is very nervous. But we, we do have all the signs and it's possible to not to pay any attention to the 30 or 40 million people who don't have health insurance and to the kids who are dying. And by the way, of those, of those kids who are, who are dying, uh, half of them 
are black. 13% of, of the black, of the population is black, but 50% of the kids who die before they are one year old are black. Uh, class and race intersect. Poverty and race intersect again uh, and again. So, um, I would suggest that we need to uh, think about uh, not just that, but how things have been omitted uh, about, about other issues than class, about war, about race. Uh, when things are omitted, uh, and when you don't know any history, uh, it's as if you were born yesterday and, and anything can be told to you. Because if you were born yesterday, the president can get on television and say, something has happened in this part of the world, we must go over there and bomb for freedom. And you have no way of checking up. Uh, you have no history to check up on this. You don't know, if you don't know any history, how many times heads of states have gone to microphones and asked the young people of this country to give up their lives and to cause other people in other countries to give up their lives for something that the, that the government has designated as a war for freedom or for liberation or for democracy or to, as, to end all wars. I think they've even stopped saying that. They've sort of given up on ending all wars because they're preparing it as they say, to fight wars again, right? That's what, why we're spending $250 billion for the military, because we have to be prepared for, as they say, and it's, the number changes from time to time, we're preparing for one and a half wars, or two wars. Well, one major war and one regional war. One major war and two regional wars, right? But we're preparing for war. Well, a little history would make you suspicious, uh, especially the young people. I understand there are high school students here from uh, Southwest High School in, 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 in the Twin Cities. And I think, of, I think of high school students as being the most vulnerable because they will graduate from high school and at some point some head of government will say, it's time for you to die for your country, for freedom, for democracy, and so on. History will come in very handy at that point. Um, and uh, we... Uh, Black people, Native Americans, um, take a different view of our history than the rest of the population. Uh, when I was teaching in the South, teaching in a black women's college in Atlanta uh, for seven years, and during the years of the Civil Rights Movement and becoming involved in the movement and beginning to read the work of black historians, I began to see American history from a, a different point of view. When I began investigating the Columbus story and, and then what, what, we, uh, what we did in rampaging across this country and annihilating Indian tribes again and again so we could have this territory, it gave me a different view of American history. You know, try to read a history of the Civil War in which they tell you that during the Civil War, when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was being put forth and, and fighting a war for freedom and so on. How many history books will tell you that during the Civil War, the United States Army moving out west took more land from the Indians than at any comparable period in American history? Uh, so, um, so, yes, history is useful sort of if you look you know, for what has been omitted. And what, uh, I'm going to try to finish up. I'm looking at my watch to pretend that I care. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, but I do. Uh, well, one of the things I, ha I have learned from, from both from reading history and from participating in social movements, from the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and, and uh, uh, even coming to Minneapolis to protest against the production of landmines. Uh, and uh, one, of the thing, one of the things I've, I've learned from that kind of experience uh, is uh, if we're going to change things, if we're going to become more conscious uh, of how, of what is happening to people in the rest of the world as a result of our policies, uh, I heard one, one a friend of mine once said, uh, 
when the, he was asked, being critical of his country, why don't you move to another country? He said, well, I'm not going to move to another country because then I'll, I'll become a victim of our foreign policy. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, but uh, how does change come about? How are we going to do anything about all of this? You know? I mean, one, one thing is clear. Real change is not going to happen in this country as a result of voting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that because I know we're all brought up on this. Uh, we, we're taught, you know, this is democracy. This, you know, democracy, the highest act of citizenship is to go to the polls every two years or four years and to pull down that little lever. You've done your job. Now you can go home and we'll take care of the rest. And they do. You say. But voting, historically, voting has not made any major changes. You know. And uh, I saw a bumper sticker not long ago which said, uh, if the gods had intended us to vote, they would have given us candidates. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't think the gods would be in a position to give us candidates because they probably don't have enough money. You see, you need money to get into the electoral process, you know. And if Jesus and, or Moses or Buddha or Muhammad showed up at the White House, you know, without money, they would not be allowed in, right? They would need $200,000 to have dinner with Clinton. Or with, if it was a Republican president, they would need $300,000, you see. That's the difference between Republicans and the Democrats. It's an enormous difference. Yeah. Uh, uh, Change has taken place in this country when people have gotten together, when citizens have organized. I mean, uh, slavery was not done away with by a, a, a Lincolnian edict. Slavery was done away with by the growth of a great anti-slavery movement in this country, a black and white abolitionist who put pressure on Lincoln again and again and again and on Congress until finally they began to act. And then they had to do it again in the 1960s uh, when, again, Kennedy, Johnson, we're not going to act until black people took to the streets and, and went to prison and were beaten and were killed. Uh, citizens got together and organized and took risks, and only then was racial segregation done away with in the South. Uh, the labor movement, the eight-hour day, was not won by uh, the, the kindness of employers deciding to give the eight-hour day, or by the initiative of government. Not at all. The eight-hour day was won by workers in the 19th century and 20th century uh, going out on strike, facing go the National Guard and the Army and struggling uh, and, and changing the conditions of their life. And women did not get to the point of this, this new feminist consciousness that we have today of, because of any government initiatives. They did it on their own. And disabled people did not win the right to, to wheelchair access or to have the streets changed so that they could move around. They did not get this because Congress or the President or because somebody who was just elected uh, uh, did anything about it. No, the, the, the channels of government that they always tell us to use, you know, to go through channels. They're not channels. They're mazes into which we are invited to get lost. Uh, and so the, 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 what we've learned historically is that we, you don't go through, the channels won't do it. The channels will only begin to work when citizens organize and create a commotion. Yeah. Garrison, the abolitionist, said to somebody who urged him to be more moderate, he said, slavery, sir, will not be overthrown without excitement, a tremendous excitement. That's still true today. We need a new movement. The possibilities are there. Uh, people have common sense. You mustn't mistake the silence of people for not caring. I learned that by being in the South and, and in the late 1950s and, and seeing what seemed to be, well, nobody was doing anything. Things were quiet. You don't know what people are thinking. You don't know what people are feeling. You don't know what indignation is building up in people who know that something is wrong. And at a certain point in history, and you don't know exactly when, uh, things begin to happen and you get a social movement against the war in Vietnam, against racial segregation, for women's rights, for gay rights at certain points in history. But the only way it happens is if people do things, the smallest of things, things that don't seem to go anywhere, things that don't seem to have any immediate effect. But that's how social movements build on the basis of 
of huge numbers of small acts that people take and that finally come together at some point. <coughs> and if you, if you do this, well, life will be different. <laughs> it will be better. Sure, you, you need economic security and you need jobs and you, you know, and uh, not everybody can be a Marv Davidoff and <laughs> become a full-time activist. Uh, you must go to the movies sometime, Marv. <laughs> but uh, you have to do those things. You have, you have to have some security. But that's not enough. You don't want to be able, it won't be import, important that you know, your grandchildren think of you, oh, wow, my grandfather and grandmother had three houses. <laughs> I'm so proud, <laughs> you say. No, there's a picture of, of them on a picket line. <laughs> there's a picture of them in some struggle for justice, you know. Uh, so that even if, if we don't, you know. Josh Gardner, and I'm a senior history major. Before I introduce today's speaker, I have been asked to remind you that next week's convocation will be Wayne Smith, visiting professor of Latin American Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He will be speaking on relations between the United States and Cuba. The feminist and anarchist Emma Goldman once said that, quote, history may be a compilation of lies, nevertheless it contains a few truths, and they are the only guides we have for the future. Today's speaker, Howard Zinn, has dedicated his life to writing the lies of history and employing those lessons to build a better future. He is a noted historian, a gifted playwright, and a passionate. The Preview Channel provides our program schedule as well. If your local cable company carries the Preview Channel, you can check it throughout the day for updated C-SPAN schedule information. C-SPAN 2 is a public service created by America's cable television companies. Each weekend on C-SPAN 2, look for About Books, original programming devoted to books, authors, bookstores, and the publishing industry. Here's a look at our program schedule. Next, historian Howard Zinn on the interpretation of history. Then Harvard professor Samuel Huntington talks about the effect of cultural diversity on global politics. He's followed by Jill Abramson of the Wall Street Journal, who discusses honorariums and journalistic ethics. Later, on America and the Courts, lawyers and judges in a mock trial debate a law banning distribution of indecent material over the Internet. And that's our program schedule. Now historian, player, and political activist Howard Zinn. He speaks about the interpretation of history and how our understanding of it affects the future. Mr. Zinn is author of the book, A People's History of the United States. He spoke last month at Carleton College in Minnesota. The program lasts about an hour. Political activist. Most of us know Mr. Zinn is the author of that book, A People's History of the United States, which our high school social studies teacher assigned as a contrast to the traditional text. In fact, the work was wildly successful and helped to usher in a whole new approach to American history. Zinn's heroes are not Columbus, capitalists, or presidents, but Native Americans, industrial workers, and all those who have risked everything to combat tyranny and oppression. Believing it impossible to separate the study of history from one's inner convictions and sense of justice, Mr. Zinn is also a tireless social crusader. Through the years, this marriage of scholarship and activism has alternatively found him writing articles attacking the Kennedy administration for its inaction with segregation and helping to organize student sit-ins, writing a book entitled the Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal, and speaking out against the Vietnam War at peace protests. 
And like most good Americans, his belief in action has landed him in jail a couple of times along the way. This fall, I read Mr. Zinn's most recent work, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train, A Personal History of Our Times. And I must say that it's his optimism and faith in the capacity of the American people to enact social change is truly inspiring. It is, it is a must read for all disillusioned college students or anyone anxious about the direction our nation is taking. I'm very excited about today's presentation. Please join me in welcoming Howard Zinn to Carleton College. What I see future is, is that of, of being the purveyor of local news. Uh, we are local. Our franchise is the local news. There's no one else that, that, that has the, the system to gather the local news and produce the local news uh, like your, your local newspaper. Well, our political point of view is, is middle of the road. Uh, we feel we have responsibility to the community to, to really uh, help the community form opinions on, on, on key and critical issues. And, uh, you know, I, I see myself as a, a political independent as far as that goes. And, and whatever's right for the community is, is, I think, what we're going to, to support. As publisher, uh, I, I, I do uh, retain 51% of the vote on the editorial board. I seldom exercise that because we have some, uh, some you know, good ideas and, and, and people that, that uh, I, I think we do come to conclusions where we're not always consensual in, in, in all of our decisions, so I seldom exercise a 51% vote on the editorial board. But overall, I'm, uh, my, my role is, is that of, of, of a leader, and, and I, I try to lead by example. I, I, I work hard myself and try to make good decisions, and, and you might say I'm the... Uh, uh, the the number one visionary of the newspaper, you might say, and um, it's my role to, to make sure we're always looking ahead to see what we're doing to make sure we, we know where we're going and that we're doing the things to help us to get there. One C-SPAN school bus spends the weekend in Philadelphia. The other bus is in New Orleans for the Cable 97 trade show. Get C-SPAN schedule information 24 hours a day by calling our schedule hotline at area code 202-628-2205. Our program schedules are also available online. You'll find us on the Internet, the World Wide Web, and a variety of online services. You can watch for schedule information. At 15 and 45 minutes past each hour, check the bottom of your screen for updates. Also several times each day, listings of programs coming up over the next few hours. These on-screen updates normally air just before 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Time and at other times through the day.